Alrighty, um, I'm Eli Hartung. I'm a senior in the botany program here, and we're going to be talking about what I think is the best group of plants, the monocots. Um, we're going to talk about their morphology, their evolution, their diversity, and we'll just dive right in. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the phylogeny first off. So the monocots fall right here into these major angiosperm clades. Um, and what's nice about them is the monocots are a monophyletic group. They're only related to each other, unlike the dicots that are split with the monocots in between. There's about 60,000 species in here, and the monocots represent about a quarter of the flowering plant diversity that we see today. Um, and so we've been talking about cotyledons and what's a monocot, what's a dicot. And so cotyledons are just these embryonic leaves that appear first after germination. If you look back at your fast plants, those first little round leaves that showed up were cotyledons. They weren't true leaves. And we'll go a little bit over anatomy real quick. So if this is your seed, um, you have your radical, which is kind of your first root to come off, your hypocotyl, which is connection between the cotyledons, those first leaves, quote unquote, and the radical, your epicotyl, which is kind of your baby shoot, and then you have your cotyledons, those baby leaves surrounded by a seed coat. And it's a little bit different for monocots and dicots. We can see um, in this picture, we can see the endosperm, that sugar that's going to kind of support the, the embryo as it develops. And then we can also see we have uh, two in the dicot and one cotyledon in, in the monocot. And then right here, we just have a picture of kind of developing ones next to each other, just so you can see kind of that difference of one to two. Um, and so this we're kind of going to go over real quick. This is just something I wanted to have you kind of as like a one-stop shop. Uh, pause the video and look at this. And this is just going to kind of compare and contrast the dicots and monocots in one screen. But we'll walk through these in the next couple slides. So monocots versus dicots. Um, so this is specific to monocots with these pictures comparing them. So monocots have hollow stems. Um, our vascular bundles in these stems are scattered and not arranged into ring-like structures like we'd see in a dicot or any trees or the tree rings that we studied last week or a couple weeks ago. Um, so the monocots don't have that kind of organization in their leaves. And that kind of feeds into the parallelination in their leaves. Um, whereas this organization in the dicots kind of feeds the net-like venation in their uh, leaves. And because the monocots don't have this arrangement of vascular tissue, um, they're not truly woody. There's no true secondary growth in the monocots. And so next we'll talk about monocot flowers. And so monocots typically um, have floral parts and arrangement of threes. And so right here is a crocus, which we get saffron from. And you can see six petals, three stamens, kind of the stereotypical threes. Um, but in the background, we can see my next point, a lot of the monocots are very, very derived. Um, up here is a wheat flower, and since they're wind pollinated, they've kind of lost that showy flower. Bananas are wild flowers, wild in both senses, I guess. Orchids as well, this is a ghost orchid, um, incredibly derived. You can't even really tell where the threes kind of fall in. And then here's a titanarum, one of the largest flowers. And so these are all monocots, and we can see kind of the stereotypical monocot and then how evolution's kind of ran wild with the whole group. Um, and so now we'll just talk about the origin of the monocots. So um, being the monocots don't have true wood, it's been kind of hard for us to have a really good fossil record of them. Um, but our molecular clocks date them to about 140 million years ago. Um, our oldest pollen grains are about 125 million years ago. And we actually do have a couple fossils. So this one right here is Sinoherba micchinensis. I won't cover up the name. And this is a relative of modern day arums, um, which is the same as these pollen grain fossils we found were from kind of relatives of modern day arums. And this fossil is dated to about 125 million years ago as well. Um, and let's talk about the evolution and kind of radiation of the monocots. And so being that monocots aren't truly woody, they've been a little bit constrained um, through their like evolutionary history. But we do see major diversification events. And this phylogeny on the right, or I guess your left, um, the four red dots kind of um, indicate major diversification events. And these green circles on the right kind of represent species diversity today. And those four major events kind of represent and feed into the four, four of the biggest groups. We have the arums on the bottom, the orchids, the asparagales, and then the grasses up top. And so those four major diversification events kind of fed into the biggest groups of monocots we see today. And so now we're just going to talk about the major orders and kind of their relationship to each other. And so this is a phylogeny of all the orders in the monocots. And we're only going to talk about four of them that are kind of the most important and useful to humans. And so we'll just dive right in and talk about them as we go. And so the first order is the Aracales of the palms. 
Um, there's about 2,700 species, mostly tropical. This is where we get palm oil, coconuts, date palms. Um, they've been called the big game of the plant world because they're huge. Um, and they're incredibly important plants to us um, between these three kind of crops. Um, this does kind of feed into this picture up top. On the left side is the Amazon rainforest. On the right side is a palm oil farm. I won't get on my soapbox now, but I think you should definitely look into kind of the, it, the issues with the palm oil industry. The next kind of, or the next order I'm going to be talking about is the asparagales. And this is the largest order of monocots. And there's a ton of diversity in this group. We have about 36,000 species and we have everything from tree like Joshua trees to millimeter wide orchids. Um, and we've got four kind of major families that I'll just mention here. We have the orchids, the asparagus, the asparagaceae, the asparagus family. We have the iris family, and we have the amaryllidaceae where daffodils fall under. And being that orchids are in this group, we do need to talk about them for one second. So orchids, depending on who you ask, are the first or second biggest family. Um, and interestingly, a lot, interestingly enough, they're not actually that important to humans besides being pretty. Uh, vanilla does come from this group, but this group's majorly just radiated through kind of coevolution with insects and fungi. And again, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but um, if you're interested in how the orchid poach poaching industry is affecting a lot of areas, I think you should look into the orchid thief. It kind of explains how dangerous and detrimental um, orchid foraging is. Um, the third order we're going to talk about is the Liliales. And so this group has about 1,500 species, so it's not one of the bigger ones, but it is important to us, especially here in Utah, where the seagull lily is our state flower. Um, we do see a ton of diversity in this group. We see heterotrophic plants, and just because these plants are mostly ornamentals doesn't make them not valuable. You've probably heard of tulip mania in about the 1600s of France and how it kind of dominated Europe, and people were basically selling their homes to get these flowers. The last and the probably most important order that we're going to talk about today is the poales. And so there's 18,000 species of the second largest order. Um, and these plants in these orders are incredibly economically important from the cereal grains that we have, the, shank, the sugar cane, uh, pineapple, they all fall into these groups. And there's kind of five major families that I've illustrated on the left. So from top to bottom, we have our Cypraceae or the sedges. Um, this is where papyrus used to come from very important wetland plants. We have our rushes, we have our grasses on the bottom, we have our bromeliads where pineapple is from, and then we have typhaceae where cattails are from. And this family is very important to us, but there are also many notable weeds, which I'll talk about in a few slides. And the next, we do have to talk about poaceae because it's so important. And I know I'm biased, but I think this is the best family of plants. There's about 12,000 species. They're absolutely the most economically important between the cereal crops, corn, wheat, and rice, that's over half your diet right there. And that's about over half of most people's diet today. We also have building materials from bamboo and biofuel from corn. Ethanol is a huge industry, especially in the US. And back to the weed stuff, we need to talk about grasses as invasive, especially here in the Intermountain West. So this plant, which I hope you're familiar with, is cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum. And it is a major issue in the Intermountain West. It covers millions of hectares of land. This is in Nevada. And the problem is cheatgrass and Medusa head, which is also a grass that has a similar lifestyle to cheatgrass, they invade a lot of sagebrush and other ecosystems. They encourage fire as winter annuals. And then they kind of come up the next year in monocultures and absolutely dominate a ton of area in the, in the West, in the Intermountain West. And so a lot of grasses are good. A lot of grasses, especially these ones, are really, really bad. So just be aware of them. Um, and so just in review, the monocots are this distinct group. They're monophyletic. They're incredibly diverse. And they are very economic important to people today. And that is my presentation. OK, let's talk a little bit about a life cycle of a typical monocot a grass a corn here. Um, and I've actually just, I'm not going to draw it because I tried and it looked bad. <clears throat> so we're going to go with, we're going to start up here at the tassel or the, this inflorescence here. And that is the male part of the plant. And we're going to have microspore mother cells that undergo meiosis and form these microspores, which are then N instead of 2N. 
and that's going to form a pollen grain, which is haploid still. And this pollen grain will, uh, when it reaches the, the ear, when, it, when it's dispersed by wind to the female part of the plant, uh, a pollen tube will form. And so we're gonna pause right here and go up to our ear of corn and go through a similar process where we've got a megaspore mother cell that undergoes meiosis, produces megaspores, and that grows into a me uh, megagametophyte, this embryo sac. And here we've got the embryo sac just as it's being fertilized or, or just as it's being um, kind of penetrated by this uh, pollen tube. And there's, these are antipodal cells. This is the egg cell. These are called synergids. But the thing I want you to really pay attention to is this right here. This is the polar nuclei, okay? Because angiosperms, uh, corn included, uh, typically undergo something called double fertilization. And what that means is that each pollen grain forms two sperm cells. Notice there's one, two sperm cells here, or at least two sperm cells. And one is going to fertilize the egg, and the other is going to fuse with the polar nuclei to generate the endosperm. Okay, so pollen grain from an inflorescence, the tassel meets a ear, uh, the, this megagametophyte embryo sac. A pollen tube forms, at least two sperm cells come and one germinates the egg, forming a zygote, and the other sperm cell fuses with that polar nuclei, forming the endosperm, and then we're going to see that typical seed anatomy like in Eli's presentation. And, and that about does it. The seed will, will germinate and form the mature sporophyte, this corn plant. And that's, that's it. It's very basic. Uh, but I wanted to go over this life cycle. This is a fairly typical grass life cycle. Uh, and I think we'll be going in more detail into more flowering plant and I caught life cycles, uh, but I just wanted to introduce you to this polar nuclei here and how double fertilization occurs.